Hey everyone, welcome back to Portal of Wisdom. I'm back today with another story for you. If you are new to the channel, like and subscribe and click that little post notification bell so you get alerted when I post new videos. And now on to today's topic. Today we are going to do a part two of the Lost Dutch Oven Mine story. And this is going to pick up where we left off. In the last video we talked about the story and pretty much what has been written everywhere about Thomas Schofield and his Lost Dutch Oven story. I will put a link to that in the description for this video so that you can click the link and go over the main story so that this video makes more sense as we pick up and go over a few more details from there. I didn't want to put the two videos together. It would make it probably too long. So we mentioned that Thomas Schofield in the last story that we talked about, we mentioned he was interviewed in 1936 around the age of 80 or so, give or take. And the details of his lost Dutch oven mine he reluctant, uh, reluctantly shared at that point as he was still looking for it. But he was getting up there in age and I believe he knew his pursuit wasn't going to last much longer. So I found an article from the San Bernardino Sun from June 8th of, of 1954 where it was stated that Tom was celebrating his 100th birthday. Now his birth date has been in question. It's either July 6th of 1854 or 1860. A lot of stuff I've seen said 1860. But he told some people in the area he was born in 1854 and I believe they went with that. And, and either way... He was at least in his mid-90s at this point, and he was old and frail at this point. So the article kind of told some more details about him, and it said he had been in the area since the 1890s where he was a fireman and a driver for a steam tractor for the Pacific Coast uh, Borax Company near Daggett, California. Then he was a water locator for the Atlantic Pacific Railroad, the predecessor to the Santa Fe Railroad. And this article stated that he was searching for water in the nearby mountains, um, I believe water for this, this Danby station he worked at since there was no water on site, it had to be brought in. So he was in the mountains looking for water and apparently he was a, a good uh, driller and everything too and was supposedly good at finding water. But this article says that at the point he found the mine, he was in the Providence Mountains north of Danby, which is a, a fair ways north of Danby when he found the mine. So the Providence Mountains are even north of current day I-40 in the Mojave National Preserve. And it was said that he was running out of water himself, so he headed toward Fenner, California to resupply. Now, if this story or recollection is correct, then it sounds like where he found that Dutch oven mine, he was much closer to Fenner to get water than he was from the Danby water station that he worked at on the railroad. So, it is possible that the mine was in the Providence Mountains, which are currently, like I said, in the Mojave National Preserve. Yeah, but one concern I have about this is, is you remember, this is June of 1894. It is hot in the desert in June, especially in the Mojave. And the it's the worst time, really, to be in the desert. And it's about 20 miles or so to the edge of the Providence Mountains. Are you going to walk 20 miles through the desert to explore some new mountains in June? It, it just seems, seems a little far. But I don't know. I don't know what type of, uh, you know, mentality he was in and, and uh, you know, what that situation was back then. There was also never a mention of him having a horse or a mule that he was on either. So it appears he was on foot. So in the article, it also stated that his later searches, he felt he had looked in every canyon in the Providence Mountains, and he must have been mistaken, and that he said he started looking in the Ship Mountains and the Clipper Mountains. 
And the Ship Mountains are about 10 miles south of Danby. And they're a pretty small mountain range. So it probably doesn't take a lot to explore those mountains. And the Clipper Mountains are, are about 5 to 10 miles north of the Danby Station. Those mountains all do seem within the realm of mountains you might explore when the trains are done for for the day and you have another day before another train you know is going to arrive that you're gonna have to supply with water the other thing I thought about is this how long had he worked for the railroad by June of 1894 so I figure he would have explored close by mountains first and maybe you kind of work yourself out in concentric circles if you haven't been at the railroad too long you're probably going to be exploring the mountain ranges like you know it's five miles to the edge of the clipper mountains and another five miles or so to get through them and they might be 10 or 15 miles long so that might be an area that that you would definitely explore the ship mountains are about 10 miles south they're fairly small mountain range the old woman mountains are to the the east but the providence mountains they don't start until a good 20 miles or so north and then they go for quite a few miles north of there so if he had been there for quite some time then maybe he gets to this point but if he hadn't been there all that long and it doesn't sound like he had been there all that long i don't know that he would have got 20 miles away there would probably be a lot of uh closer mountain ranges for him to explore for water and prospect while he's doing so. So if he barely made it to Fenner to get water, and we know Fenner was closer than Danby, I think that eliminates the Ship Mountains, because the Ship Mountains are way closer to Danby than Fenner is. So if you were in the Ship Mountains and you needed to make it back to your your workplace where you're going to have water you're going to make it to Danby way before you get to Fenner so it sounds like that's probably out if if Fenner was the place that he ended up at the the thoughts on that is if it really was Fenner that that he went to yeah it's possible he was in the south end of the Providence Mountains but like he said he explored all of those mountains and all those canyons because that's in his mind where he thought he was so um, and I don't know the details on on that but the other the other thing that that pops out in my mind and looking at the mountain ranges there is that to the east there is a mountain range called the old woman mountains and the northern end of those mountains may be closer to Fenner than Danby so if you were in the northern part of that uh, range or if in a you were in a certain part of that range it could be that Fenner was a little bit closer than Danby and if you're out of water that might be the place you would be going you'd want to go to the closest place to get water when you're in the desert in the middle of the summer so I did find an article from 1941 in a magazine that told the story and it mentions the old woman mountains too when it comes to this story so to keep in mind this story is about a year I think it's October of 1941 a year maybe maybe close to two years after Tom had given up the hunt because they said he gave up the hunt around 1940 and this article is from October 1941 so this article in 1941 though it does question if at that point the lost Dutch oven mine had possibly already been found and may already be under mining operation at that point. And if that was the case, and if Tom happened to know this, then maybe he does want to keep people away from another mining operation and he may have lost his window for this mine. Someone else found it after him and had the claims. And if that's the case, then you know, he might have missed his, his window, and and uh, I don't know at what point he may have, have found this out. Um, but this article, let me get into it here. It's by Rex Bellamy from 1941. And I'm going to read some excerpts from this article so that we can kind of go over some things that, that were said at this, at this point. 
And it says, was the legendary lost Dutch oven mine of the Mojave Desert in the Clipper Mountains or the Old Woman Mountains? Tom Schofield, who first told the story of finding the rich gold, reported it was in the Clippers, but he never went back to it. And now a new generation of mining men have relocated a valuable deposit which answers the description of the old Dutch oven, except that it is in the Old Woman Mountain Range, about 20 miles to the south. Tom Schofield probably knows the answer, but he won't tell. And you can read the story and draw your own conclusions, it says. So Clifford Gillespie says in this article, the old mine has been found and it is now being worked. He said when he leased this mining property, he had not read the story of the lost Dutch oven. But Gillespie is a mining man, not a prospector. So it says he first became interested in the mine one day when he stopped at Danby, California, as he was returning to Los Angeles from claims near Needles, California. And that day at Danby, a mining man told Gillespie about a prospector who had recently taken out high-grade gold ore from his claim nearby. Gillespie went out to investigate and found the prospector had located a rich vein. He made extended exploration. So this and surveys made made for him by Los Angeles mining engineers indicated that the entire rugged region was rich in gold deposits enough to warrant development. So Gillespie learned that the gold ore outcroppings were covered by claims. Eventually he leased them. One claim covered an old mine shaft that had been worked previously. He sublet some of the leases and kept one covering the old mine for his own operations. His crew now blasting a crosscut tunnel below the old mine shaft. Some of the richest ore test as high as $500 a ton, it says. And this is 1941. So here's one thing Clifford Gillespie had to say. At first there was no reason to suspect I had leased the lost Dutch oven mine. Because my leases are all in the Old Woman Mountains, about 10 miles south of Danby. Tom Schofield's lost mine was supposed to be 10 miles north of Danby in the Clipper Mountains. But I was curious enough to read the story. So the article goes on to say Tom Schofield was experienced in drilling and blasting tunnels and solid rock, but he was a born gold prospector and he spent his spare time every hour in the mountains looking for outcroppings of ore and looking for water. So it says one day he followed tracks of mountain sheep into a gulch that he previously had not explored. He was surprised to see faint traces of an old trail. He followed it to a spring that trickled from a wall of rock to form a pool at the base. Backtracking over the trail, he traced it with great difficulty over three low hills, the hogback of two ranges, and then into another canyon. By this time, he was thoroughly puzzled. He had explored these mountains for a long period without ever seeing a human being or traces of humans so he said no one at Danby had ever mentioned other prospectors in this region and this trail was evidently made by men although it had not been used recently the story goes on to say that Tom said that the trail finally appeared to end in a blank wall but desert trails do not end that way, so he carefully retraced his steps and discovered faint traces of a path that led up a steep hillside. Here he came to solid rock and the trail was no longer visible. He curiously impelled him to go on towards two upright rocks, a cleft in the side of the mountain. The passageway between them was barely wide enough for a pack animal to go through. And it doesn't say if he had a pack animal or if that was just his, his thoughts. So beyond, he picked up the trail again, and it led toward a black mass of rock, 
like an immense boulder. It was a conspicuous landmark. The route skirted around it, and he stopped suddenly and shouted again and again, but received no answer except for echoes. Since there before him was an old camp, tent poles were still standing with shreds of canvas flapping in the breeze. Uh, a bed of boughs was covered with a tattered blanket, and a small pile of railroad ties lay at one side, some of them split into lagging for timbering a mine. Said nearby, of course, were mining tools, drills, axes, picks, shovels, heavy hammers, all rusted from the weather and disuse. Still resting over a fireplace of blackened boulders was a rather large iron Dutch oven, such as miners used to bake their sourdough bread, fry their bacon, and sometimes for roasting out of high-grade ore. Tom scrutinized everything carefully, but he could find no clues to the owners nor why and when they had left. So Tom said he followed a trail that led away from the abandoned camp, and it went up the mountainside, perilously close to sheer drops of hundreds of feet, and the crudely made trail led him over loose slipping rocks to a shaft on the steep slope, undoubtedly the mine belonging to the owners of the abandoned camp. So it said at this point, of course, Tom wanted to see if this mine shaft was just a dead-end thing and it didn't produce anything or whether it was a once-in-a-lifetime find. And so he crushed some of the ore and he panned out some rich findings of gold and he knew it was a rich gold vein. It wasn't just a dead-end mine site that was abandoned for not being worth mining. And he said that the rock that was most heavily impregnated with gold was the bluish quartz formation um, with a sulfide in it and he said that's what the assayer, assayer later described it as and Tom when he was there he worked feverishly in the sun and the sun went down rather fast and he was forced to spend the night there <laughs> So he came down to the abandoned camp and he spent the night there. So it said at daybreak he made some further exploration of this location and he noted that the shaft was well timbered and it was at its top uh, it had split railroad ties and a windlass was was still rigged with a rope and bucket and he lowered the bucket to estimate the depth of the shaft and then compared the depth with the size of the pile of ore on the dump next to the mine and he determined very little of the ore seemed to have been taken away at this point so obviously these men that were mining either got interrupted or, I don't know, maybe they disappeared into civilization for a while and couldn't find their way back either. So this story states, of course, he filled his pockets with gold. He was hungry and thirsty. He lifted his camp canteen to take a drink. It was drained. So he poked around the camp looking for any sort of water or anything else he overlooked and he found nothing and upset he kicked off the lid of the Dutch oven and instead of food he saw gold and so he then put a bunch of that gold in his pockets too and it sounds like it was a pretty large Dutch oven there was no way he could carry all of that gold and there was a lot more gold in the mine up on the hill so it states that he was suffering from hunger and thirst and he made his way back over the old trail and finally reached his camp. I don't know if they were talking where the, uh, the spring came off of the mountain. I'm assuming that he filled his canteen at that point according to the story um, details that would make the most sense. And then it says he went on to Danby and then on to Los Angeles. So this story does not mention Fenner in any way. So this kind of has me wondering if the article when Tom was said to be 100 years old, if he maybe 
was mixing up some details in his mind and and maybe he had been to Fenner multiple times when he had been exploring various mountains but maybe some of that those facts got jumbled in his mind or maybe he wasn't quite in his right mind at the very end and maybe Fenner didn't have anything to do with it because this article in 1941 after he had given up the hunt does state he made it back into Danby and then took a train you know, out, uh, you know, out to LA. And that makes more sense when it comes down to it. So the writer of this article, Rex, continues to go on. Apparently, he was with a party and they were going to do some searching. They were telling the story, but they were also, you know, interviewing Tom and going out to look for themselves. And so... They mention at this time that Tom was living in Chambliss, California, when the writer's party, you know, including, you know, the writer and some other people, they, they set up to go look for evidence of the lost Dutch oven mine that had, you know, possibly been found according to Clifford Gillespie. So he says, at Danby, our party... Ask Johnny Nielsen, do people ever come here asking about the lost mine in the Clipper Mountains? And he said he looked up in surprise why there are people out there looking for it right now. They've been coming here over, ever since I arrived here over 16 years ago. So Johnny Nielsen, it says at that point, he owned a combination store, filling station, and auto camp on the highway. I believe this is on Route 66. So... He says, the writer says, from his place, we drove a short distance south to the old Danby station on the Santa Fe. And just a few shacks splotching the desert between the old woman mountains and the Clipper Mountains were what was there. So we took a rough miner's road off southward. From this, we branched off into the foothills of the old woman range. Stopping at the mouth of a canyon, we followed footprints of mountain sheep for a few hundred yards to a spring seeping from the rocky wall into a drinking pool. Beyond this canyon, the rough road crosses three ridges or hogbacks, then goes upward until it makes a turn to a level space confronting a narrow passageway between two high ledges of rock. True to the story, it is barely wide enough for a packed animal to pass. It fits the description unmistakably. You cannot doubt it is the one that Thomas Schofield discovered in 1894. They said, now there's a cool spring near the entrance of the Rock Cleft Canyon. It is used by the miners who have sublet one of Clifford Gillespie's claims a few yards away. Winding upward, we sighted the old-time trail with the great black boulder-like mass beyond. One foot, we followed the old trail, rounded the big rock we came upon an old abandoned campsite. Smoke-stained boulders formed a fireplace. Other boulders were arranged in a rectangle that may have been around a tent. We found tailings from past gold pannings and ancient rusted camp stove, all, all there in evidence of pioneer gold prospectors' camp life. From the abandoned campsite, we climbed the old trail along the perilously steep canyon side, up the weather-beaten windlass over the old mine that is still timbered with split railroad ties, just as young Schofield said he found nearly 50 years ago. With the story in hand, we followed the ancient trail, checked the fixed landmarks, all pointing conclusively to the fact that here was the lost Dutch oven mine. So, can it be true that the stuff Schofield found assayed as rich in gold as the story states? Certainly, is the answer for one of the, one of the prospectors and mining men there. They explain it this way. The old-time operators of the mine concentrated or high-graded their ore. Some of this ran as high as $500 a ton. 
as it is now known from Gillespie's present operations. So they handpicked chunks of this rich stuff, they chipped out the softer bluish sulfide from the hard quartz, then they pounded or ground the stuff. Thus, after panning or spooning it, they obtained a concentrated or a concentrate that could run as much as several thousand dollars a ton. This is why did those old timers go to so much trouble? Because of the almost inaccessible location of their mine. It was not practical to consider hauling it out untreated as untreated ore, even though it averaged high in gold. But they could pack out comparatively small quantities of rich concentrate and make the labor worthwhile, at least until they, you know, until they could finance roads and mining machinery. So the author goes on to say, but what about Dutch ovens filled with pure virgin gold? Says that is explained, the mining men tell us. Dutch ovens were part of the camp outfits of the old sourdough prospectors used for baking and roasting over an open campfire. Present day prospectors use them too. They are made of heavy cast iron with an overhanging lid so that the oven can be entirely embedded in hot coals. Prospectors found out that they could use their Dutch ovens as crude smelters, especially for treating sulfide ore like that which came from this old mine. The hand-picked pulverized sul sulfide ore was put into the Dutch oven and roasted over a hot fire, made hotter, maybe with bellows. Thus the sulfur was burned out, leaving gold mingled with fine stuff to be panned out to still pure gold. And the author goes on to say that uh, we don't know why the original prospectors never came back to their, their claim. And it said Thomas Schofield was unable to re relocate the mine himself, which was unusual because he's a veteran prospector who knows this part of a desert like a book. What does he say about the mine which Gillespie believes to be the lost Dutch oven now that's actually being worked? And they said Tom was non-committal. He never gives direct answers to questions about the lost mine. He talks freely, but never discusses location nor details, except to say that the amount of gold he took from the Dutch oven has been greatly exaggerated in the retelling of the story. He doesn't try to mislead anyone. He just rambles on about the great deal of min mineral wealth in the area. And the article goes on to talk a little bit more, but nothing of real critical importance. The ultimate thing I get out of the article is it sounds like the lost Dutch oven mine was found and was being mined by Clifford Gillespie. And it sounds like all of these very unique details on the trail to the mine are details that match up with with Gillespie's mine and and maybe at some point Thomas Schofield found this out and and maybe that's when he quit looking for it or steered people in a different direction as not to bother looking in the correct mountains and and bother Mr. Gillespie and his claims we don't really know for sure but according to this article, it sure does sound like the the lost Dutch oven mine was actually found. And I know there have been people out there looking for it in, you know, in a lot of different uh, mountain ranges around Danby. But I don't know what, what your thoughts are on this. But this was a 1941 article, late 1941, once... Once Thomas Schofield had quit looking, although he didn't really give a lot of details that, yes, it's been found or whatever, but that's when Mr. Gillespie came into the picture and the author of this article went on this excursion and basically said that everything seemed to match up and it was being mined. So anyhow, I guess that might be the real end to the lost Dutch oven mine. It's still been a fascinating story, but it may have got mined out. I don't know. It's in a pretty desolate area, so I, I don't know what's going on there today. So like and subscribe if you like these kind of stories.